da, 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 da. we're live and we're adjusting the camera there we go that's good i made a little more space over here all right so this is class Class number three. Class number three. And we are going to be studying entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. Small business. And this is the first lecture in this series, so lecture number one. All right. So that's where we're at. Um, today we're going to go over some basics. Basics. Get you all familiar with what entrepreneurship is, what kind of people run small businesses, um, what different entrepreneurs do, and so on and so forth. So, we'll begin, I'm going to have a little bit of coffee, and then we'll begin in about two minutes. Ah, okay. Never mind on the two minutes, let's just begin. I need to find a better place for this eraser where it's not falling. I think I'll put it over here. All right. So, the first thing about being an entrepreneur is that you need to dream big, very big. Now, dreaming big is a relative thing, right? So if you've spent your entire career so far, um, I, I always bring it back to pizza. If you spent your entire career so far serving a pizza, then dreaming big might be opening a pizza shop. If you spent your entire career running pizza shops, dreaming big might be opening up franchises um, or inventing some kind of microwave or frozen pizza, developing some kind of uh, you know better recipe or, or whatever it is. But, but the fact of the matter is that if you want to pursue something, you need to dream Right, so if your dream is to replace one job with another, that's that's not particularly dreaming big. And I, I'll go back to exactly what that means in the future, but for now, all we need to know is that entrepreneurship is on the rise. I'm just going to write ent because that word is very long. But entrepreneurship is on the rise. Right? So more and more people are founding businesses. And the reason this is happening is that two things are happening pretty much simultaneously, right? The cost of starting a company, the cost of starting is declining, is going down, right? So in the past, in order to have some kind of accounting function, you'd need to go out and hire an accountant, pay an exorbitant amount of money for them every month, um, and so the cost of starting a business would be very expensive. Furthermore, if you wanted to attract customers, your marketing costs would be predominantly in word of mouth or newspapers or on billboards. Again, things that are relatively scarce and cost a lot of money. So a newspaper can only put so many ads in them. And, you know, over the last couple of years, that number of ads has increased as newspapers have declined in sales. However, however, the cost of advertising on the internet is literally pennies, right? So this is a huge thing and extremely important. So the cost of starting a business is declining. That means more and more people can get in. That also means that failure is less punishing. Failure is less punishing. Right? 
And this is an important thing to keep in mind because a very, very, very large amount of new ventures fail for various reasons. And we'll talk about those reasons and how to avoid some of them. But the reality is a lot of them are inevitable. They just happen, right? So failure is becoming less and less punishing. The second thing that's driving entrepreneurship to keep increasing is that the technology, the technology we have today is shifting faster than ever. It's shifting faster, right? This is an important thing to understand because, I mean, many, if not most of you have grown up with the internet as a regular thing, right? It's not it's not something that you think about like, oh, well, we recently had the internet. And, oh, no, I mean, you grew up with the internet being a regular thing. You grew up with uh, MP3, CD players changing to MP3 players changing to iPods. Now everything's on your phone. Now your, your headphones are wireless and so on and so forth, right? So you, basically the acceleration curve of technology, it has gone something like this over 500 years. So there's basically nothing happening and then it just exploded. Right, this is like the industrial revolution over here, right? And then this is like, you know, the last 10 years, right? It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. So what's happening is as this technology is shifting, it's creating more and more opportunity for innovation, right? And people are capturing that opportunity for innovation. And that's leading a lot more people to go into business. So for example, you could make a very small change a very small change in how you, uh, for example, in how you automate the human resources function, right? So if you automate the human resources, shoot, this eraser is going to be the end of the game, I swear. Okay, so the way that you, let, let's say that you decide that you're working in the human resources department and you see that there is this huge, huge opportunity for changing and automating a lot of the processes that you have, right? So when you think about this on an individual scale, I mean, you might automate away your job and, and you know, let's say you make 75,000 a year, right? And you, you know, you've saved your company 75,000 a year. If you're, if you're particularly cunning, you know, you'll, you won't tell your company that you've automated your job. And there are stories like that of people just, just keeping their salary and, and automating their job. Right? But if you could take this and scale this and sell this to a thousand companies, right? Sell this to 1,000 companies and charge them each, not 75, but 50,000 a year. So realize them a $25,000 a year savings, right? You could be looking at a really, really, really nice chunk of money, right? So we're talking about 50,000 with another three zeros, right? That's $50 million, that's a $50 million business that you've turned out of a small automation, right? And therefore, these kinds of innovations are pretty massive. I mean, if you bring something like this to a bank and you say, hey, you know, I've got 50 customers already and I think I'm going to be able to keep growing at a pace of 10% per month or per year or whatever it is, I'd like to borrow money, banks are actually a little hesitant to do so, but venture capital firms will gladly give you the money if you have a good business concept. So entrepreneurship is increasing. Another thing that's happening is during tough times, right? and by tough times I mean economic downturns, entrepreneurship rises. Uh, entrepreneurship rises, right? And this is a natural cause and effect, right? People are losing their jobs. They need additional income, whatever it is. And so they decide that the risk is relatively low. Well, I've already lost my job, right? So I'm not risking my job. I might as well try out and see if I can build this new company, start this new venture, have this new idea, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, and so what we end up seeing is that things like income inequality, things like economic downturns, things like jobless rates, all drive entrepreneurship up, right? And this is just a natural cause and effect because 
Truly, the people that have lost their jobs and are suffering from tough time can understand most directly what other people in their situations are also looking for, right? So whether that's a cheaper slice of pizza, right? I mean, New York during 2008, one of the biggest exploding businesses, small businesses in New York was the $1 slice, right? You walk into a pizza shop and you get a $1 slice. I think for a while they were even doing a promotion where for $1.50, you can get a slice and a soda. Right? And that's like a 50 cent slice. Right? So that's that's a pretty big increase. Oh, excuse me, it was for, for 250, you get two slices of the soda. Um, but the reason they were able to do that is because a lot of the people that lost their jobs understood that people still have to eat. Right? People still have to eat, and if we can mass produce this pizza, there's gonna be a lot of customers. Right? So fundamentally, right, when you start a new venture. Any venture. So when you start a venture, when you start any venture, what you are trying to do is you are trying to reduce scarcity, right? That's the goal. So you're trying to reduce scarcity, right? So if anybody remembers, um, I don't remember because I wasn't around yet, but I, you know, I have seen several homes with it, including my own home now. During the 80s, everybody loved carpets. And the reason was that before that, everybody loved carpets that was rich, right? So carpets became massively available to everyone, and so everyone went about and carpeted their entire home, right? So this was a natural reduction of scarcity. And if you think about anything else, so things like smartphones, things like uh, more accessible and cheaper computers, all of them fundamentally try to address some problem of scarcity, whether it's enough computing power, enough mobility, um, a low enough price, whatever it is that's preventing people from getting that item, entrepreneurs will try to reduce that barrier and therefore cash in on, on everything they're going to make, right? So it's important for us to talk about a class goal, right? So this is a different class than money and banking. It's entrepreneurship and small business management. And our class goal is to get you prepared, get you prepared to run your own venture. To run your own venture. Right. So many of you probably have business ideas. Many of you probably have opportunities. Some of you have family businesses that you're going to be taking over and running. Whatever it is, whatever small opportunity, large opportunity that you see out there, the reality is many of you, if not most of you, will probably end up running your own venture. Right. The trend in our economy is actually in the decentralization of companies, right? So it used to be that if this was the company, right, HR would be in here, right, accounting would be in here, sales would be here, so on and so forth, right? All the departments would be inside the company. Today, what we're seeing is we're seeing an ever increasing trend of contractors. Right? Where customer service is contracted out, sales are contracted out, research and development is contracted out, and so on and so forth. Right, And the reality is that many of these companies that are already contracting out to the larger company in the center are beginning to rely more and more on contractors themselves, so scientists, researchers, right, salesmen, all are going to be here, right? And that's actually a very natural progression because we have become more and more specialized. But also, when you sit at a company and you're the human resources person or the IT person, the reality is you're spending the majority of your time not doing anything, right? Unless you're really overworked and it's terrible, the majority of your time is spent just sitting there waiting for something to happen so that you have something to do. These companies erode that, right? This salesman can be busy all the time 
because he's involved in sales for five different companies, right? And this sales organization is happy to give the salesman most of the money because they're able to collect from multiple different sources and insulate themselves, right? This is also a great way to manage risk. I mean, if you sold, I don't know, if you sold tape decks, right? So like, you know, those cassette players, Walkmans, right? If you sold Walkmans for a living, you were pretty undiversified. So basically when Walkmans got replaced, you'd have to either go start selling MP3 players or find a different job, right? Um, if you're not, if you're working as a salesman for one of these sales organizations, what you're going to start finding is that you are better diversified. So for example, the sales of ice cream are declining, but the sales of fish products are going up, right? And there are these huge companies. So when I worked in the food industry, we actually worked with one of these sales companies. And they go out, they take your product, and they pitch it to different supermarkets, right? They come up with a strategy, they help you do it, because they are specialists in specific pieces of that product, right? Whether it's uh, specialists in dairy or specialists in meats or whatever it is that you're a specialist in. All right, so that's the first thing. We're going to get you prepared to launch and run your own venture. Now, the second thing we're going to try to do in this class is we're going to get you to believe in your ability, your ability to succeed. This is perhaps a much larger, much more difficult, much more challenging piece of running a company. If you don't believe that you can succeed, and I don't mean just being egotistical and saying, well, I'm the best and I can do whatever I want. No. Your ability to succeed depends directly on your confidence level in being able to overcome obstacles. Overcome obstacles. And the only way, the only way you're going to have the strength to keep overcoming them, because as you run a company... If everything is going well, you're just taking in money, you have no job. The reason you have a job running a company is because there are obstacles. And the obstacles that you are going to be overcoming are going to be increasing in complexity, in difficulty, right? Because once you've solved an obstacle, it never pops up again, right? If it does come up, you already know how to tackle it, so you don't think about it very much. You just move on. But all the new obstacles are going to be challenging. And that's an exciting thing as long as you have commitment to your venture. And commitment is a huge thing. Commitment doesn't imply that you have some contract that says that you need to work for five years or you know your bonus is tied to how much the company makes or any of that. No. Commitment is the fact that you are willing to put the work in to overcome the obstacles no matter the obstacles. So there is no obstacle too great, right? Um, and we're going to try to learn a lot of that way of thinking about problems, right? So any problem can be solved with the right tools. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to equip you with the right tools to solve these problems as they come up in your venture. So what are entrepreneurs? Right? What are entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs are risk takers. I'm sure you've thought about it before, but you go into work and you get paid some wage, right? $10 an hour, $5 an hour, whatever it is, $100 an hour, right? You get paid some wage. That wage is a lot less than you produce, right? You probably produce way more money. And yes, some of it goes to paying for the inputs and so on and so forth. But because your wage is guaranteed, you are not taking any risk. Outside of getting fired, there is no risk that at the end of the week you won't get paid, right? This is why salespeople generally that are paid on commission tend to make more money than hourly employees because they are taking the risk, right? And I don't mean most salespeople. I mean the salespeople that are successful at what they do. The majority of salespeople make less than people that work at an hourly rate, right? And that's simply because you're not taking risks. So as an entrepreneur, you're taking the largest risk. 
and therefore you often are entitled to the largest piece of the pie, uh, the largest piece of the credit, and so on and so forth. Now we'll talk about being a humble entrepreneur towards the end of this lesson, but the important thing to know is that entrepreneurs fundamentally are risk takers, right? No matter how much market research you have, no matter how good your business plan is, or anything you've worked out, the reality is it's still a risk. The pizza shop is still a risk. The Microsoft is still a risk. All of those things are still a risk. Even starting up a Twitch stream is still a risk, right? Because at the very least, you're foregoing income that you could have been having in order to do it, right? The second thing that entrepreneurs are is innovators. Innovators. Now, innovators doesn't necessarily mean that you're Thomas Edison and you're inventing new light bulbs. Innovators doesn't necessarily mean that you're building some huge technology that's going to revolutionize the world. That's not what innovators are. Innovators simply look at an existing problem and try to come up with a unique solution, right? So if your existing problem is that there is no pizza shop near you that delivers, right, your unique solution might be to open a pizza shop, right? It also might be a simpler innovation, right? So you might say, hey, I'm going to start a delivery company that's only going to deliver pizza to our local residents from the closest pizza shop I can find. And for that, I'm going to charge a $5 fee. And I think people are going to be willing to pay the $5 fee plus tip to get pizza because they can't get it now, right? That's an innovation. That's an innovation. And that's an important thing to consider is your business does not have to invent something new. You don't have to be, uh, you know, a mathematician that discovers some, some amazing way to, to, you know, harvest gold from the ocean or anything like that, right? As a matter of fact, most of those innovations that are purely uh, inventive or purely based on invention um, are, are, rare, are rarely truly successful. Um, and the reason is people don't always accept new innovation. Uh, so what they do is they wait. They simply wait. Um, and they wait for someone else to go ahead and push it onto them, right? And that's something that you'll be doing a lot of when you're starting a business. You'll be pushing your product onto other people, right? And I, I don't mean in the same way that like essential oils are pushed onto other people. You'll be trying to help people understand why this is valuable to them and why this is good for them, right? So, finally, entrepreneurs are relentlessly focused, relentlessly focused, focused on creating value, focused on creating value. So this is very important, right? This is value for their investors, value for themselves, value first and foremost for their customers, for their suppliers, right? They are trying to repurpose something in the world, whether that's effort, skill, um, labor, plastic, manufacturing, whatever, whatever resources are out there, they are trying to repurpose and shape them in order to create value to the end user and then hopefully to themselves and to the business, right? So, and that's an important thing also to be focused on when you're thinking about a new venture is how are you creating value? Why would someone find what you're doing valuable? Now, the final thing that many people more recently have come across is making the world a better place. Now, your innovation or your company doesn't have to cure cancer. It doesn't have to stop world hunger. It doesn't have to do all of those things or any of them. As a matter of fact, that delivery company that I discussed earlier that brings pizza from a distant pizza shop to local residents for a fee makes the world a better place, right? You get to define what that means. What does it mean to make the world a better place? Well, I used to not have access to pizza, and now I do, so the world is a better place. Um, 
you know, people in certain remote parts of India didn't have electricity, and now they do. That makes the world a better place, right? And the greater your impact on the world, the more you will find resources, resources, the more you will find skills, and the more you will find the drive to keep going, right? So let's think about that pizza example. You go to the pizza shop and you say, hey, I'd like to do deliveries for you to this distant place. I'll be sitting right outside in my car the whole day. You guys just come out, give me the pizza, give me the address, and I'll bring it to them. I get to keep the $5. You guys keep the price of the pizza. Maybe you figure out, you know, how about the pizza shops takes a 250 hit and you take a 250 hit, right? So, you know, you kind of share in that cost and in that fee. And then you're sitting in your car and it's been five days and not a single person has ordered pizza, right? So maybe you go out and you drop off some flyers and you try to put some stuff together and, and you know, maybe you get one order the next week. But the week after that, again, it's zero, right? If you go to a bank and you say, I'd like to launch a TV campaign, you're not going to find resources. You're not. If you go to someone and you say, hey, you know, I need someone to, um, to be actually a very good driver back and forth. You know, be able to take the phone calls, be able to do everything on the fly so that I can offload that from the pizzeria. You're not going to find someone interested in being hired because you're unable to pay them anything. And then when you, for the third week, nothing happens. And for the third week, you've kind of started to exhaust your resources and your abilities and everything else. And, and, you know, it's hard to justify to your family that you're doing something for basically the sake of nothing. You will lose drive, right? Now, as you scale up, you're the world a better place, making the world a better place you will find that your access to resources, to skills, and to drive increase very quickly because you realize that your goal is so long-term, it's so distant, but it can have such an impact that even the tiny chance, even if you fail 999 times and you have a 0.01% chance of succeeding, that 0.01% chance is worth pursuing, right? So it's important. It's important that you balance those things when selecting a venture and understand them ahead of time. There's nothing inherently wrong with one venture or the other. But if you spend 10 years sitting outside the pizza shop waiting for deliveries and spending all of your savings and money on advertising, you've wasted your time. Why? Because you haven't figured out what the end goal of what you're doing is and how much of an impact it can have. And had you done that, you would know that you have a certain amount of time that you can do this for before it begins to run out. Okay. Next. Making the world a better place is nice. And that's, and that's very important in, in kind of selecting what you do and, and making it good and all of that stuff. But... But, make money, right? This is something that sometimes people have some kind of negative association with. Well, you know, uh, I, I don't want to seem like I'm ripping people off or like I'm taking money away or, or whatever. You're not. You're not. You should be thinking about how you can make money because this allows you to keep growing and satisfy more customers. Keep growing. Satisfy more customers. More customers. You can improve your services. You can improve your service. Uh, you can... Oh. You can pay your taxes. Which helps your local city, state jurisdiction, right, country, everything around you, and you can give to charity. So that money isn't wasted. That money isn't wasted. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about pricing your product, and we're going to talk about some of the psychological things that happen when a person sees a price, right? 
So I'm sure you've all seen, right, when, when your local supermarket makes something $4, it doesn't sell as well as when they make it $3.99. Right? And the reason is we tend to kind of capture that first number. Right? Now, most of you can round up to $4 and say, well, that costs $4. But it's going to catch your attention because it's a 3. Right? And, you know, $2.99 the same way. Right? This is going to catch your attention first. So, that's one psychological aspect of pricing. The second is that if you've ever seen people pay ridiculous amounts of money for things of relatively slightly better quality, but certainly not tenfold better quality, right? Price is a form of communication. Is a form of communication, right? So if I went out today, right, and I said that in order to, or I said I'm going to go ahead and manufacture a slice of pizza. Just one slice of pizza, right? And I'm going to make this slice of pizza, and it's going to cost 10 bucks. 10 bucks for a slice of pizza, right? And I do all the advertising and everything around it because what I'm making is truly something I believe is a unique slice of pizza that's difficult to get that isn't available elsewhere, that uses, you know, spring water from, from you know, some foreign country and flour that's gluten-free and, you know, tomatoes that are harvested only in the sunshine of Italy and so on and so forth, I can get away with charging $10, right? Now, if I put all those amazing ingredients into a 50-cent slice, even before people see the amazing ingredients they're going to see the price and they're going to make some assumptions their assumptions are going to be how am i getting the price so low well the way i'm getting it so low is by using bad ingredients and many of them won't even go to that second step right so when you see a high price tag a lot of the time the intention is either to communicate prestige quality and to get you to further investigate why this thing costs so much right it's a form of engagement whereas when you see 50 cents, you might actually try it and think it's an awesome slice of pizza and you might tell your friends and that might be a reasonable way to run a business. It really might be, right? But the reality is it's important to remember that when you're pricing something, it's a form of communication. Hey there, Dudog22, welcome. Um, so, okay. That's the price. That's the price of communication. If you guys have any questions, um, you know, feel free to post them in the chat. I'll be I'll be checking in once in a while, but literally any questions are fine. If you want to like um, at me or whatever the questions, just so it pops up in you know more bold, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to answer anything. So, a lot of you have probably considered becoming self-employed, right? This is largely what Twitch has done, right? Is decentralized the platform for streaming and allowed people to become self-employed. Uber has done this for driving and other businesses will do this for marketing, for sales, for everything else, right? They will allow you to become self-employed. Now, here's something really interesting that you should know. Self-employed people are four times more likely to be millionaires. Four times more likely to be millionaires if you're self-employed. And as high as 15 times more likely to enjoy job satisfaction. Right? This is a massive thing. And this is something really worth considering when you're choosing your career. Right? Because all the research up to this point has shown that the more freedom you have in doing what you love and doing what you want to do, the more satisfied you are, and therefore the more productive and the better your results will be. Right. So when you're deciding and choosing on what you're going to do, this is going to be a huge step forward. Now. 
let's talk about why why start a business or motivations now different people have different motivations right different people have very different motivations some people want to make a difference some people want to make a living some people want to make a killing right different people have very different motivations and so it's important to evaluate them individually right so the first motivation is get rich quick right believe it or not this is not something that's new to MLM or pyramid schemes or anything like that people have been trying to get rich quick yeah I mean basically as far back as alchemy probably farther back there have been charlatans and people selling all kinds of nonsense right get rich quick has been around for a long time right some people have realized that perhaps this isn't the healthiest way to approach business right so so maybe it's time to get rich slowly right and getting rich slowly will be a topic for our personal finance class where it makes sense it makes sense to get rich slowly uh, if you make the right decisions and you invest and you slowly grow your business and everything goes well right you're still taking a lot of risk right get rich quick feels like less risk because you're putting some money up front if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't right now you get to be your own boss you get to be your own boss now this is actually really important right being your own boss is kind of a big deal now the truth is this never quite happens right as someone who's who's ventured pretty deep into entrepreneurship has been basically self-employed my entire life um, being your own boss isn't always true because really really your boss is the customer right? your customer ends up being your boss your clients end up being your boss all of these people end up being your boss right however you do get to choose how and what you do in order to please these people if you want your business to succeed and if at some point you decide that you don't care where the business goes and you've made enough and you feel satisfied you can just stop doing all those things right now you've always had that freedom if you worked for someone but the reality is that being your own boss gives you a certain amount of creative and personal freedom right some people their motivation is to escape a bad situation. Escape a bad situation. So if you decide that your goal is to escape a bad situation, whether that's some job that you despise where you're overworked or truly anything else of that matter, you can go ahead and escape a bad situation excuse me by trying to start your own company and growing right so for example if life has just turned out in a way where you don't have certain qualifications or something like that but you believe that you can truly make a difference and do something great go ahead and do it because it could be a way out of your situation and if it isn't I mean the reality is you're back to where you started which which I mean really is okay because you took a break from it being a bad situation some people of course enjoy satisfying work enjoy satisfying work now this is really important right this is really important okay well I have a bias here right because this is the reason that I do the work that I do is I enjoy work that is truly satisfying right that inside makes me feel like I've made a difference, like I've done something good, like I've done something that allows other people to prosper or be well, and that I've done so in a way where everybody wins, right? Um, this isn't true about everything, obviously, but if you enjoy satisfying work, entrepreneurship might be the right goal for you. And finally, a lot of people go into ventures to find fulfillment. Find fulfillment. And this is actually pretty important. This is actually pretty important, right? If you remember Maslow's uh, Pyramid of Needs, whatever it's called, Hierarchy of Needs, right? The last one is self-actualization. So finding fulfillment in your work, finding fulfillment in the things that you do is very important once you've found all the other things. And a lot of people find that fulfillment and discover a great deal about yourself. Because when you're when you're Starting a company, when you're running a business, when, you're be, when you become an entrepreneur, 
the thing that's important is that this is this is kind of like having a bunch of girlfriends or boyfriends and then getting married, right? You're taking the time to not only find out about your business and your customers and your processes and how you can make them better, but you're taking the time to discover more about yourself, right? And discovering more about yourself is extremely important, and that's part of finding fulfillment. You're going to discover your limitations. You're going to discover, and we're going to discuss shortly, burnout, right? You're going to discover a lot of these things about yourself. You're going to discover how it is that you function and, and what things are good and what things are not, and that's a huge thing. That's a huge thing, and it's extremely important, right? So finding fulfillment is very good. So these are the motivations for becoming an entrepreneur. You can get rich quick, get rich slow, you can be your own boss, you can escape a bad situation, you can enjoy satisfying work, and you can find fulfillment, right? Amongst other things. But all in all, those tend to be the reasons that people become entrepreneurs or become self-employed or run small businesses or anything else. All right, let's continue. Let's see how we're doing on time. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to cover this next section. If you guys have any questions, just start posting them now. I'm going to sit down in about two minutes just to take a look at any questions and try to answer them, right? So there's founders, and entrepreneur founders are people that start companies on their own, and they're usually a unique vision of some sort. Uh, and there's franchisers, franchisers. And franchisers don't have an easier job, they just have a different job, right? So founders will start something unique, whereas franchisers will go ahead and open a McDonald's or open a Bally's Fitness, right? Bally's Fitness. So what they'll do is they'll basically offload a lot of the work to these major corporations, so something like food delivery, getting the food from farms and so on and so forth. And for certain businesses, this is the only way to do this. Because if you wanted to open your own McDonald's, you would need to have a cattle farm lined up. You would need to have, you know, wheat lined up and a bakery and all of this stuff. It would be, it would be a huge amount of overhead, right? Whereas McDonald's is able to reduce all those costs of raw and allow you to go into business. Now, of course, they're going to charge you an arm and a leg, a piece of your profits and a fee on top of that, regardless of how much money you make, to stay in business because they have to pay their bills too and they have to make their money too. Now, of course, you could found, as a founder, you could found a company like McDonald's that allows others to franchise, right? I mean, I think one of the bigger successes most recently was Subways, right? Subways is predominantly franchiser owned. Um, and the reason is they have very low franchising fees. They allowed you to buy in for something like 15,000 plus to space. Right? So your franchising fee was almost nothing. And, and you know, you'd buy all the equipment from them and so on and so forth. But there's lots of different ways to start a company. Right? And none of these is better or worse. Right? As a matter of fact, some founders take something existing. Right? So they'll inherit a, a company from their parents or you know, a boss will say, I want you to take over. And then they'll go ahead and introduce something unique and think about things differently. So you don't need to go ahead and file your paperwork to open a new C Corp. Just to become a founder, there's actually lots of opportunities to do it in the regular world every day. All right. That's founders. One more thing, and then I'll get to questions. So high potential. High potential, or what are called gazelles. <coughs> Excuse me. I have no idea how to spell gazelle, so... I'm just going to leave it at high potential. Small firms. Small firms and lifestyle business. Lifestyle business. So these are three kind of levels, right? So high potential is something like that marketing business that we talked about earlier, right? You're able to service thousands of companies. You're able to charge them each $50,000 per year. For your services, you're able to perform them for a fraction of that cost because it's automated. So you have huge potential. You could potentially go global. You found something that people need, right? Bottled water is pretty high potential. Small firms are different. Small firms usually specialize in a geography, right? So for the most part, they'll have some geographic concentration where they'll work on, um, you know, they'll work on production locally. Right, so something like 
a plumbing company, right, would be a small firm, right? And, and they can grow to actually quite a reasonable amount of money, but the reality is they're never going to become the global plumbing company. Or at least, if they have the aspiration to do so, they would be categorized under high potential, and it would be a difficult feat considering how varied plumbing is and how unreasonable it is to have overhead for no reason, right? And then finally, you have a lifestyle business. And the lifestyle business is actually very interesting. Right, a lifestyle business is something that you do so that you can live your life the way you want. And this is perhaps something that most people will be interested in, right? So, for example, if you decide to stream on Twitch, you have a lifestyle business. Because you don't go to an office every day. You go and you stream on Twitch, usually from your home, maybe from a home office, right? But you're not going very far, so it's enabling a lifestyle, right? For some people, owning a store is a lifestyle business because they like the merchandising and everything else. They have no... Aspirations to grow a small firm, to open a second store, high potential, to, to open a, a national chain or anything like that. They simply want to maintain their lifestyle with their business, right? And that's perfectly fine. And when you're starting out, it's important to determine where you are. There is no level of prestige, right? The only level of prestige that there is, is twofold, right? Level one is trying, right? So 90 percent of people, probably more, will never try. So even if you tried, you've earned 50 percent of the prestige. The second level of prestige is success, right? 90 percent of people will fail after this point. If you succeed, you will earn 50 percent of the prestige, right? This is all the prestige. You tried and you succeeded. Now, how many times you tried doesn't matter as long as you succeeded in the end, right? But if you categorize correctly what your ambitions are and what your goals are and the way that you're looking at things, you're going to have the right growth avenue. Because the thing is, if you're actually starting a lifestyle business because you personally want to sustain a certain lifestyle, but you think it's a high potential business, you're going to end up scaling all the wrong things and driving yourself out of business. If, on the other hand, what you're starting is a high potential business and you've said, no, I really just want it to be a lifestyle business, you're not going to scale, and therefore you're never going to realize all of the money that you could be making and all of the growth and all of the good that you could be doing by selling yourself short. And so, in a way, you would have failed already. So before I move on to the next section, I'd like to sit down, answer some questions, see what you guys think. All right, let's take a look. The video is getting choppy. Audio is okay. All right. Um, yeah, it is. It is definitely the Wi-Fi. I'm seeing that we're actually dropping a lot of frames. Whoa. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what I can do about that right this second, to be honest. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can close some stuff. I'm not sure that I even have anything open. This eating the Wi-Fi besides